This is Caitlin. She likes tomato ketchup. She likes it too much. She's just had eight baby teeth removed. This is Leon. His mother follows him home with a wheelchair because he's too heavy to walk. Macaulay is 13. He's been drinking half a bottle of vodka every Friday. These children belong to a generation with conditions that doctors say are preventable. It sounds like she's been drinking vodka straight. Alcohol misuse, childhood obesity, rotting teeth, and hearing problems linked to parental smoking. Doctors say these conditions are caused by the way children live. just shouldn't be happening. You know, these children should not be suffering from these problems and they should not be here at this hospital. And people are starting to say, maybe this is a generation where children will be dying before their parents. So how do we get to this stage? Well, tonight we'll be looking at the scale of preventable conditions. We'll be talking to the children who are suffering to the staff who are treating them. This summer, Panorama was offered unprecedented access to the largest and busiest children's hospital in Europe. Old Hay in Liverpool treats more than 200,000 patients a year. Doctors invited us in to see the impact on the kids and the health service of the preventable epidemic that's costing the hospital a million pounds a year. Obesity is affecting the lives of more and more children. When their condition gets serious, they come to see Dr. Mohammed Didi. This morning, he's seeing Leon, his mother and grandmother. Hello. Good morning. Will you fix some boards on the bed? Leon has the average weight of a 17-year-old, but he is only five. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. There you are, it big is. boy. Do you want to fix him? I think he's hurt his leg. All right. He's hurt his leg. That's because of all the flying he's doing, isn't it? Yeah. You fix his leg for me then. Why do you fix then. his arms? All right, fix his arms. It's strange. Oh, okay. Leon's not an isolated case. Dr. Dee Dee is seeing bigger children at a younger age. It's maybe to do with their diet, with parents working quite often, the amount of time they spend watching television, how much time they spend outside being physically active, and the type of foods they eat. Doctors can only do so much medically. His chat with the family is about trying to find out where the problem really lies. You mentioned last time when I came that you thought that he's, the rate of weight gain had Improved. Yeah, yeah that's. I think that might be thing because he's gone a lot taller. Yeah. This is going to really help him with his yeah. activities. Yeah. So they yeah. do sorts of push man. They don't, yeah. they don't like um, sit him out of anything, yeah. whatever the other children do, yeah. he does with them. Yeah. Leon, Leon, put that one back, please. Leon, Leon. One back. that's a bit expensive. Yeah. There's oh, a good boy. boy. There's a, Thank there's you. A good boy. But whatever it is, I think if we can increase his physical activity, it's going to be helpful. Leon's mother is convinced his weight is due to genetics rather than his diet or lack of exercise. Yeah, his mum and I yeah. know there's someone else there to yeah. around because I've done, yeah. and you know, we've done everything. Yeah. I mean, I've just yeah. paid 300 pounds for a dog yeah. to take him for walk. Yeah. We've done everything. Yeah. Let's check Buzz's weight. Buzz is two kilograms. Wow. How old is he? He's two. Dr. Dee Dee's organising blood tests to see whether the cause is genetic, but he isn't confident that it is. That's great. Leon is a difficult one. He's been seriously overweight for some time. I'm not hugely optimistic about finding an underlying cause for it, but I think that uh, he deserves us looking for that. Leon, Leon, how is Buzz doing? 
buzz is fine. Just need to be active like buzz, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Thank Charging you around. <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Parents often assure him they're doing their bit, but the big question as far as Dr Didi is concerned is what really goes on in the home. Hello. Hello. One of the hospital's busiest areas is the dental department. The main problem, widespread tooth decay. Nearly half of the thousand dental extractions performed here every year are in children under six. What's her name? Shall we call uh, Claire? Caitlin is five. She's got toothache and has to have all eight molar teeth out. Caitlin has one particular weakness. She loves sweets. Which I'm at the nine. She does love her sweets. And she loves tomato sauce. She went through a very large bottle of wheat to herself. Which is basically a family would have within two weeks, three weeks, she had it to herself. On a daily basis, I'll say that she'll have half a mug full. She's a very active child, <laughs> so I think she needs to sugar more than anything else. Because she's tiny and needs a general anaesthetic, she has to have the operation in hospital. So we're just taking the, um, the molar teeth out now. Upper and lower. Caitlin's one of 312 dental operations here this summer. Now, there could have been sweet drinks, sweets, biscuits, anything. It's just too much sugar in the diet. A number of consequences. We've now lost the, the baby molar teeth. They wouldn't normally drop out till about 10 to 11. So at six or seven, the first permanent molars arrive behind those baby teeth. They will have nothing to stop them moving forward. And so to take some permanent teeth out properly, just to really crowd it. Dental health in the northwest is amongst the worst in the country. But of course, tooth decay is the ultimate preventable condition. It can be entirely avoided with brushing and diet. She's fine, okay? Caitlin? Caitlin, is mommy? Hello, chicken. You want me to sleep? Oh, well, there's a big smile. <laughs> She's fine, okay? Yeah. Show your mouth. Watch your hands. Wow, still got a pretty smile. Mm. Hey? Hey. Is that your teeth? It was sickening. Wouldn't expect any other parent to go through that. Under anaesthetic, that anything can go wrong, can't it? That was my main worry. But now, I'm not worried now, she's here. The lifestyles are going to change after this, treating wise. And I'm just going to find out more information about everything sugary sweets, you name it. Fizzy drinks are stopping. The law. That's the point about these conditions. They can be avoided. But even in areas where the health issues have been flagged up for decades, like smoking, children are still suffering through no fault of their own. Here in the Northwest, one in five adults smoke. Most of them are in their late 20s. Smoking is a big problem for the hospital. The biggest area probably is in terms of chest infections, asthma, wheezing, bronchitis. I reckon somewhere between about 500 and 1,000 children a year come to this hospital because they're exposed to their parents' cigarette smoke. Smoking affects children who have a common condition called glue ear. Glue ear, in which delicate ear tubes get blocked, requires surgery in which a ventilation tube or grommet is inserted in the ear. Alder Hay carried out 400 of these operations last year. But passive smoking can aggravate the grommets and even cause them to come out too soon.
The chief nurse at the ear, nose and throat clinic tries to spot smoking around her young patients. Very good. It's the smell. You can see damage to the hairs in the ear canal. Sometimes if I see it quite bright yellow, then I just might ask the question. And often than not, the answer I get back is, yes, there is smoking around that child. This morning, she's seeing six-year-old Alex. He's had grommets before, and he may need them again. Basically, compared with his last hearing test, there has been some improvement. How's he doing in schools? Is there an Still improvement fine. in school yeah. as well? Has he had grommets before? Yeah. yeah. Can I just ask you, is there any smoking in the home? I smoke, but we smoke outside. We, we smoke, smoke outside. outside. It really doesn't make any difference that you actually do smoke outside, because you know when you come in, mm -hmm. it's still on your breath. It still might have an effect on his, on, on his ears and on his hearing. I mean, it's better. It's better than inside. It's better than inside, but, you know, it's still on you afterwards for a good couple of hours. And really, every time you have a cigarette, so you would have to stay away from Alex for a good couple of hours and have a shower and change your clothes every time you smoked. Alison's message has got through to Alex's dad, Peter. I didn't realise that when you have a cigarette, it actually stays on your breath and actually on your clothes, and that can affect his hearing, which you didn't know. So I'm going to try and pack in, to be honest. Like, better for me and better for him. The message has also got through to Alex. Make your lungs go black. How's school going? OK, doing well. Can hear your teacher OK? Yeah. Yeah, good, OK. Ten-year-old Mark is another of Alison's patients. He's had glue ear since he was five. Hearing problems at this age can affect all parts of his life. I just ask you, is there any smoking in the home? Yes, dad does. Paul. His dad does. Yes, yeah. Does he smoke within the home, does uh, he? No, there's And they just say that actually going outside doesn't help. Right. OK. Right. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, it can affect, yeah. you know, Mark's ears. You know, the passive smoking, obviously, mm -hmm. can affect his hearing. Perhaps you can take some leaflet homes for dad? Yeah, yeah, I've tried to has see. he tried? No, it, it is difficult. The, he's been on the oh, has he? Hands. I can tell by his ears that, you know, the smoke has been affecting him a little yes. bit. If you could tell Dad, perhaps yeah. you could tell Dad, eh? OK, then. Right, That's thanks lovely. Well. Thanks very right. much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mark and his mother are both worried about Dad smoking. It's bad. Yeah. I told him a million times why well, you didn't listen. Yeah, I'm just trying to have a talk to him and see if he's trying to give up again. Which hopefully he will. 8386. Dear Doctor, Mark attended Gromit Clint today for review. After discussion with Mum, um, there was some smoking within the family home, um, which I gave Mum a brief intervention on the effects of passive smoking um, and glue ear. So what impact will this information have on the two smoking dads? <coughs> Alex lives with his father, Peter, and his grandparents. Peter is a single dad. What? <laughs> He smoked 12 a day for 20 years. How's he getting on with his promise to give up smoking? And I have actually packed in smoking, so it's done all right, like, you know what I mean? Well, I've been without for three days. I had a little slip the other day, I had one the other day, cos I was like... <sighs> but then... But having one in three days is better than having 30 in three days. <laughs> Come on, stand up, you've got to stand up. <laughs> but I do lose me temper. That is the one down part of it. I do lose me temper, like, shouting and that. Seem less relaxed. It's probably because I've got more energy. I'm not even more. No, don't throw it on anyone. Let me do what you say. I'm not going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so what has persuaded him to give up? At the end of the day, I'm 37 now, and Alex is only six. And I want to still be here when I'm 67 and 77, because he's still only going to be young, isn't he? So that's the main reason. More so than the glue ear link and that. Just go back. I'm going back. I don't go anywhere now. Mark's family lives on the other side of Liverpool. His father, Stephen, refuses to accept he should stop smoking. Nobody's proved to me that I'm causing my son's illness. They might say I have, but they can't prove it. Do you see, like, they give you 
leaflets and cases of liver disease and this and that. But you, they say that's all to do with smoking. Well, that could do for anything. The pollution in the air, the, all the car exhaust fumes, you know what I mean? So that could damage your liver as well. So they can't just blame it all on cigarettes. That's what I'm on about. They, they blame everything on cigarettes. Mark's mother told the nurse his dad smokes outside the home, but Dad told us precisely where he smokes. In my chair. Maybe where I'm sitting now. And sometimes if I'm, if I'm going out, I smoke outside or whatever. I mean, it's just like all the time when the kids are smoking, the kids are playing outside, so they hardly know it in, in here. Mark's mother told us how severely Mark's hearing had been affected before he'd had the grommets put in. He really couldn't hear, couldn't speak. The speech would be quite slow, couldn't understand them. It was a condition Mark's dad says he hadn't appreciated. When I used to ask him for things, he pretends he's not there. Like, I just thought he's just engrossed in the, in the film. You know what I mean? Or in the computer game, so I don't really notice it until he ends up going to the hospital and he said that this, he needs his ears to him. A month after we filmed him and his family, we returned to see Mark. How are his ears now? Sometimes I itch my ear and it goes a bit off and I can't fix it then. A few minutes I fix it back and I can hear better, but sometimes it does that. So when you sat here and it's gone, what's that like? A bit annoying because I, can't, I can hear a bit like, but I can't hear that good. So you can't hear the television? No, not that good. Mark's dad, now newly wed to Mark's mother, has cut down the cigarettes, but he's still smoking in his chair. People might think, you're his dad, it might be a little bit irresponsible of you to keep smoking when the doctors say stop because it's harming his ears. What do you say to that? I just say, I say well, so they actually give me proof that I am doing it. But then, the doctors are saying it. Uh, yeah, doctors say anything. To, but they're the, treating your son. No, the doctors, it's like the government, they tell you what to do, where to do it and how to do it. If they didn't like something, to tell you it's bad for you. You're not convinced? No, not really, no. In some cases, the picture emerging is of children locked into their family's unhealthy lifestyles. They get no choice but all the consequences. When you think of tooth decay and obesity and smoking, where does responsibility lie, do you think? We could stop all of them, not with high technology medicine, but with simple things that really parents can take responsibility and authority for and make happen. School's out on the East Liverpool Council Estate where Sharon has come to meet her five-year-old son, Leon. It's a journey of 700 yards, but Leon struggles with walking, so Sharon and her mother stand by with a wheelchair. Let's see if we can make it to the grass. Once you get to the grass, I'll let you sit down. I've got a competition, man. I see who won. Who won? I did. Did you win the day yeah. competition? You never. I did. Oh, that's brilliant. Well done. Well done. Despite Dr Dee Dee's advice to increase Leon's physical exercise, Sharon thinks she can't make him do any more than he already does. All right, then, do you want to sit? Do you want to sit now? Little sis. How much more activity have I got to increase on a five-year-old? At the end of the day, he's five. He's not 18, I can go running six miles and go in the gym and all that. I'll, I'll push Leon to his activity until I know Leon's breathing is getting affected, then I'll stop. Sharon doesn't think Leon's weight is down to what he eats. She believes it's a genetic problem that hasn't yet been diagnosed. There's that many cures for everything. So surely they've got to find out what it is. It might turn out that it's going to be nothing. They might get us 18, whatever, and be this six foot lad who's built like that. Then fair enough. But until he's that age where he's, I know he's going to be like that, then there's got to be something there, hasn't he? There's got to be. Mm. What colour are you going? The blue ones. So what are we going to look for first? The blue ones. His mother insists Leon's diet is healthy. As we film for two hours, we see how hard she works and the difficulties she faces. Excuse me. Stop that. 
Okay, I don't want to go on and look for me. Calm down. Count to five, okay? And calm down. Can you calm down now? Oh, look. Okay. Is it in this bag? No. Yeah, look, is it in this one? No. Well, how about, listen, no. listen, how about strawberry, apple, orange, banana, all chopped up in a bowl, and don't give Amy none? No. Okay. Well, I'm going to have a cake. Do you want me to go and get you some in a minute? No. Okay. Listen, do you want to wait for 20 minutes and then we'll go and see Reese? So no, far, I had a little Well, you can't see Reese if you're crying. <laughs> Is that what you're looking for? Please. <laughs> hey. What did you say to Nanny? We had a bit of a thing because Leon wanted chocolate cake. Leon's not used to having chocolate cake. But it was a party at the school. Now, I am not going to Leon's school and saying, Leon can't have that party because he's not allowed there. I am not going to isolate him any further than what he already gets isolated as it is. Within minutes of eating the cake, Leon's mother was offering him another snack. We to bake some strawberries. We to bake some. I'm talking to you. We to bake some strawberries on. Yeah. Or banana. Leon. Leon. Do you want me strawberries on or banana? Leon's mother is fiercely defensive of what she feeds her son. There you go. I just wish someone by okay. put a camera in the corner of my house and watch my son, then come back and tell me I'm doing something wrong. Because I guarantee they won't find nothing. Guarantee. Mushy peas. Yeah, mushy peas. Okie dokie. No, we'll don't eat the broccoli, we'll eat the rest. All right, I'll take the broccoli off. Did your teeth come out yet? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Have you told you getting you've got your new teeth? You're getting new front teeth, aren't you? I've got new teeth. Let's have a look. <laughs> no talking, man. <laughs> a month later, we returned to Leon's house. Could Sharon be sure she wasn't overfeeding him? Now, there's no question that you feed Leon healthy food. Yeah. But when, when our cameras were here last time, we were here for a couple of hours, yeah. Leon had some cake. Now, he'd just been to a party, so as you say, you don't deny but him did, treats. Did you see the size of the cake that Leon had? It was only a small piece, exactly. but then he had Weetabix with fruit piled on top, and then, then he had a, what seemed to be a pretty big meal. I mean, that was, seemed to me to be quite a lot of food in two hours. No, why would there be a lot of food when the Weetabix is his fibre with his fruit on? So it's not on this, on this Weetabix anyway. And it was fish, mashed potato and veg. So how is that a high intake food? But that could be the problem, couldn't it? That although he's getting good food, he's getting a lot of it. No. I'm not a doctor, but it struck me as quite a lot of food in a short period of time. And was it chips and pizzas? Uh, no, it wasn't. It was all good, healthy exactly. food. And uh, you are clearly a good, healthy mum, but you could be loving him too much. You could be giving him loads of food that's good for him, but a lot of it. Is that potentially an issue? No. No, it's not an issue. At the consultation, Dr Dee Dee had encouraged her to give Leon more exercise. So why was she using a wheelchair? But a five-year-old boy, should he have a wheelchair? He should be able to walk. Well, he? if it's a five-year-old boy, he weighs ten stone odd. Answer me that. But wouldn't the exercise help reduce the weight? Isn't it the other way around? No. Leon does get exercise. That's what I'm saying to you. Leon does get exercise. Leon can go for a walk. Leon can be out all day. I saw Dr Dee Dee and he was urging you to encourage more and more exercise. Yeah. And then the next thing I saw was, was Leon in a wheelchair. And I what, think people... halfway home from a school after yeah, spending he... all day in school? He did, but he's a five-year-old lad, isn't yeah. he? Leon's use of a wheelchair came as a surprise to Dr Dee Dee. I was not aware of this wheelchair till it came to light about a month ago. And I hope to take this matter up with uh, uh, Leon's mother. I think it's an unhelpful thing to have that wheelchair. His weight does limit his physical activity. That is accepted, but I think that the wheelchair is unhelpful. And uh, I need to win her over to handing that back. The thing is, the situation is getting worse. Nationally, childhood obesity is on the rise, particularly in boys under 10. And it's a serious condition. It can lead to diabetes, heart disease, even premature death. The general health of children 
and adults has improved, but maybe if we can't reverse this for the first time ever, we'll start to lose ground and adults will be dying younger. And the thought of, you know, um, a 50 year old person dying when they've got 80 year old parents, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. There are drastic solutions to obesity. This is lunch for one of Dr. Dee Dee's other patients. Zoe is 16. A year ago, she became the youngest person to have bariatric surgery on the NHS. The gastric bypass operation reduced her stomach to the size of an egg. And now, she can't eat portions bigger than this. It wouldn't go down my body, it'd just get stuck in my throat, and then you'd just be sick. It's a high-risk, highly controversial procedure and is only considered for young people in exceptional circumstances. Dr Dee believes Zoe's life would have been in danger if she hadn't have had the operation. Any risks from surgery were less than the risks from leaving her untreated. Uh, she was well over 200 kilograms. That's well over 400 pounds. Uh, and I thought that we needed to bite the bullet and go for it. And uh, I, I think so far, it looks as if that was the right decision. But that's not a decision to be taken lightly. Alderhey currently doesn't provide this surgery. And Zoe, her mother, and Dr. Dee Dee worked hard to get the operation, which was carried out in Sheffield. It's given a brand new lease of life. Zoe's so never in. She's more bubbly. She's more outgoing. She's got quite a bit of confidence now, which she never had. I did weigh all the options up. What can happen, the side effects, but there's a, a lot of risks in. Anything can, she's worth more. But that's not the end of it. Further operations are required, as well as psychological support. That's fine, that's great. You want to come across? Sometimes she's crying and she doesn't know why she's crying. She was crying the other day. Zoe, I'm sorry to hear that, and I didn't know about this. Um... Later this year, Zoe will undergo plastic surgery at Alderhey to remove excess skin tissue. You've made huge progress. You're now walking. Really, more than most girls of your age would yeah. do. Mum has just told me that you walk from here to the old swamp. That, that's quite a good distance, and every day. Good that's great. I think you've lost 27 kilograms in the past nine months. That's a huge amount. Check it down a little bit further. Obesity is a national crisis. One in ten five-year-olds are obese. More than 5,000 adults and children were admitted to hospital last year with the condition. It's likely the NHS will struggle to cope with the growing bill for treating obesity. <laughs> Zoe's mother says she doesn't believe Zoe's weight is the result of overfeeding at home. What she ate was what I give her in the house, which was a healthy option. What she done outside, I had no control of if she was in school or um, just going to shop even for the walk, I didn't have control of that. Zoe's case apart, Dr Dee Dee says overfeeding is often a major cause of obesity. I think it's to do sometimes with mothering. There are some complex dynamics in families where that sort of thing happens. So obesity could be, rather than a lack of caring, it can be kind of an overloving, loving too much? Yes, without appreciating that it is uh, going in the wrong direction. Sometimes that is so. Spend time at Alderhey and the preventable conditions keep coming. Alfie is three years old. Today he's come into hospital to have nine baby teeth taken out. His teeth have rotted because of his favourite treat. Alfie actually is quite fond of lollipops. He can eat anything between four and five lollipops a day. And it's just a genuine normal lollipop. Like chub pop, chub lollies or stuff like that. As soon as he wakes up, you'll have a lollipop. Not open, he won't eat it. You'll have his breakfast and stuff like that. I don't normally give sweets. 
Do you know what I mean? But it'll, if it suffices and then shuts them up, you'll just happy. Walk around with it. And it's not only lollipops. Alf has been going to bed with a bottle and not brushing his teeth before he falls asleep. Alfie had the bottle all the time. It's just like a comfort for him. He's always, as soon as he's trying, he's got to have the bottle. As soon as he goes to sleep, he has to have his bottle. Alfie's mother is full of guilt. I feel absolutely terrible. I feel like it's my fault. And I'm going to cry in a minute. So. Ready? Okay, can I take them? Okay. Is she come? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Mum, are you ready? Come on. Oh, all right. Thank you. Dental surgeon Sharon Lee treats a constant stream of toddlers with tooth decay caused by nighttime bottles. All decay is caused by probably too much sugar intake at frequent times and essentially it's probably lack of brushing as well. Obviously it upsets me um, immensely but obviously we, we do have a, a duty of care and a job to do to look after the child not just from a dental point of view but also their general well-being um, and obviously if they're not eating and, and not happy at sort of nursery or at home then essentially that um, we, we do have to intervene uh, and we do unfortunately have to take quite a few teeth out. Alfie's mother is one of many parents we watch sobbing as their child recovered from general anaesthetic. I went and had a ciggy and cried my eyes out. I phoned my friend and cried my eyes out. And just came back here and wasted. It's horrible. The horriblest thing I've ever had to go through in my life. Just watching him go asleep in your arms and he's just helpless, isn't he? It's... No more sweets for you, mate. Is there? And that's a promise voiced by several of the parents we filmed. So what happens to these promises? No, Caitlin, come on, eat it. You don't have to eat it. Can you just sit there with the boys then? Until they've finished? Go on. Caitlin is the five-year-old girl who had eight teeth removed because of her fondness for sweets and tomato sauce. But without the ketchup, Caitlin's finding vegetables pretty unappealing. Come on, Caitlin. Do you want some cake? Eat a little bit of mash and please. Be a good girl. You be good. Please let me. Do you want me to sit you down? I have the same face every day. Don't we? No? Hey. Her mother said the diet would change, so has it? I put down majority of the sweets, they only get a cheap one today. Cut out the tomato sauce altogether. It's going to be a struggle, but I've got to do what I need to do. And that's going to be a killer for me, but... It doesn't bother it, does it? <laughs> There's no question Caitlin's mum is doing her best to change things, but these are big changes, and losing the sugary food altogether it's hard. Are you running? Across town, Alfie's mother has managed to wean him off the lollipops, but weaning him off his bucket or bottle is harder going. Oh, my bottle! <laughs> oh, my bottle! This is Alfie. Oh, my bottle! Oh, my bottle! You want to have a bucket, love? 
Okay. No, no love. You've been a good boy today. Come here. I'm going to be now. I'm going to Bucky. I'm walking it now. It's gone. What? I'm going to be now. Do you want to get on there? No. Well, stop it now. I'm going to be now. <laughs> Alfie lives with his mother and two older brothers in one of the toughest neighbourhoods in Liverpool. Even while we were filming, the police carried out a raid at a neighbour's house. It's not about the area, it's how you bring your kids up yourself. I like to know where my kids are and what they're doing. As long as I do that and make sure they go to school and they don't bunk off and stuff, I think they'll be fine. It's more about the upbringing than anything, isn't it? Treating preventable conditions costs the hospital about a million pounds a year. The cost of a brand new MRI scanner. It also puts enormous strain on the theatres. We can't cope with the pressures that we've got already. Um, day case especially, dental, ENT, um, orthopaedics, we're struggling on for the bigger cases. But it's the day cases that we need a faster turnover. Alder Hayes operating theatres are already running at 97% capacity. We just had a member of staff go off sick, so that member of staff's on at weekend. We've got not many overtime lists going on at the moment anyway. Numbers are a bit short. ENT and dental are the main two. At ENT, we've got 111 waiters that we need to find sessions for over the next three to four weeks. Same with dental. Both dental consultants are under quite a bit of pressure to put more on the list, but then the list's overrun. So it's just about rejiggling at the moment and seeing where we can fit the patients in. When you're up here, you see the impact that this epidemic of preventable conditions is having on older hay. It's not just the child who is suffering. The treatment costs precious resources. It's clogging up the operating theatres. We've got so much money, so much resource in the NHS, we really need to use it where we need to use it. And in a sense, we're wasting it. That's money that we could be using to do more heart surgery, uh, to improve the care of patients with cancer. Uh, and to deal with the things that aren't preventable. Do you want to see the uh, fresh fruit trolley? To try and take some pressure out of the system, the hospital's here? now turning to prevention as well as cure. Have you heard of an aubergine? That's your aubergine. <laughs> it's putting more resources into educating the public about improving health, aimed as much at the parents as the children. Do you know how to eat a kiwi, Dad? Uh, peel the skin off. Nah, best way to do it, cut the top off like it's a boiled egg and hold the skin and scoop it out like that. A year ago, the hospital introduced this weekly fruit trolley to encourage healthy eating. Do you want to see our funny trolley with animals on? We absolutely don't preach the message here at Alder Hay. If we did, it wouldn't work. We make it fun and we get our parents to enjoy it with us. This is the Goals programme and it too is about prevention. Backed by the hospital and the council, it targets children with weight problems. Nationally, £275 million is being spent on the Change for Life programme to improve diets and exercise. Here, it's intensive, 18 sessions in gym and classroom. We're talking about making small changes to the child's physical activity behaviours and to their eating behaviours, and parents obviously play a key role in that. They, they, they control what food comes into the home, they control what, what activity the child can do outside the home, but it's also about looking at the parent's own behaviour as well. They're not trying to blame parents, but they do expect them to take responsibility. One of the things that they need to learn to do is say no to the child. Because a lot of parents we see, they feel like they're depriving their children if they're not giving them those high-fat, high-sugary foods. 
Which remember we've said about the importance of our fruit and vegetables, haven't we? And how many should we eat every day? Five. Yeah, try and eat five a day, okay? So when we say we should eat five a day, how do we measure then how big one portion is? Can you Helpful. remember? Yeah. 11-year-old Lawrence and his grandmother have managed to get on the scheme. It's just good, better than sitting in the house, isn't it? I used to, I used to go to cadets before this and I find this a lot more entertaining. So, is there any here that people haven't tried before? Papaya. The Sharon fruit. <laughs> the papaya and the Sharon fruit, OK? Before you put it in, take it off your feet. There you go. Lawrence's diet used to be very different. Unhealthy foods like noodles, golden drummers, turkey burgers. But now I know, even though I don't fry them, it's better if they're oven cooked. So I could have those things, but only on a Saturday. Do we all need to have a try, so? No. A little Some bit more. Day. Go on then, do you want to press it down? Lawrence comes with his grandmother because his mother works. They've all had to change their eating habits. Because a lot of the time, I'd let them have what they wanted. Now, I won't let them have the crisps or the biscuits. And we used to cook together, we cook cakes. But now we cook meals instead of cakes. Is that a, is that a bit thick? Yeah. We can just... First one was nicer. But too thin. There's a lot at stake for Lawrence. He says his weight has made him a target at school. They call me fatty, they call me everything like that. But that's just primary school, so I've came here to improve it for when I go up to secondary, in case it gets worse up there when I go up. Chili chicken and curry noodles. Boy, that sounds good. At home in West Liverpool, Lawrence's mother downplayed the name calling. They're all as bad as one another. All the kids sort of have a little go at each other. And I don't think it's ever been done in a really malicious way. His mother says she's always offered Lawrence a healthy diet, but concedes there may have been some secret snacking. I do think there's been times where, because he's not allowed the sweets and, and things like that, that he has secretly at things, a little biscuit here or a little biscuit there. Whether he's still doing it, I must admit, I haven't found any evidence. There's nothing left around, just in case he does. Probably about when I was six or seven, if I felt hungry, I would. Biscuits, mainly. If it was a custard cream, obviously, yeah, because you know they're lovely, and if you know where they are, you're going to want to sneak one or two. So is this just Liverpool's problem? Alderhey does serve some of the country's most deprived communities, and life expectancy here is one of the lowest in Britain. But children's hospitals across the country confirm they too are seeing the same problems. Clearly, poverty is part of it, and many people eat badly and exercise little. But all summer long, we've seen families making the same basic mistakes. They're simply not aware that they're putting their children's health at risk. Paul is four years old. He lives with his sister Libby in St Helens. Tomorrow, he's going into Alderhay to have eight milk teeth removed. His mother's been told the tooth decay is being caused by his late night bottle. I couldn't really get the bottle off him. That was like more of comfort. Going to bed or after a meal or even going out playing, he'd have to have this bottle with him all the time. If you see around his side, I'm not talking to you now. Maybe I should have took it off him earlier and left it late. Um, just couldn't get it off him. That's what he liked, so that's what he got. <laughs> Rachel was unaware of the risk of decay. You think you're doing the right thing, but you're not, are you? Because you haven't got other people to tie you. Well, you shouldn't give him the bottle of juice because it's rotting your teeth.
The experience left Rachel determined to change the routine of Paul's sister. Definitely, I won't be giving juice. She doesn't drink juice anyway, so I'm going to try and get her off the lock on now when I go away. Come on, look out here. Someone now. Oh, it's here. Uh oh, it's here. Two weeks later, we met up with Rachel and the children to find out how she's getting on. Well, she still has a bottle, as you can see, but. Um, it... We just give her like a one mil of milk and the rest is cold water. Mama. She'll she'll get on the settee. Well, she's asking for it now because she's tired. Mama, as soon as she... <laughs> Come give Libby a bottle for me, baby, please. On a night time when it's time for bed, we'll give her a drink. But as soon as her eyes shut, the bottle falls and then we take it off her. So does Libby get a chance to clean her teeth before she sleeps? No, well, um, it's mainly water anyway. There's hardly any milk in it. When do you ever get angry when you see children, lots of children, coming through the doors of this hospital yeah. with absolutely preventable conditions? I try not to get angry. Uh, I get very disappointed and I think what a terrible shame this is that we have to do these things that we, we shouldn't be doing. Um, and that we could be using the resources differently. All the time we're under pressure to make sure that the taxpayers' money we receive in this hospital is used as effectively as possible to get the best health we can for children that, that come here. So it is awfully disappointing that, that money's wasted. You know, we could be using that money to do some other amazing things. Friday night on a South Liverpool housing estate, a mother is looking for her 13-year-old son. Are you lads, you're all right? You see Macaulay anyway, lads? People around the area tell me that he drinks. At the moment, I don't know what to believe. When he said, yes, he drink, I've asked him, yeah. And I don't agree with what he does, or um, you can't stop when you're not there, can you? And I do drink bottles of vodka stuff like that, and bottles of um, Blue Wicked, um, beers, cider, anything really, a big body guy. Kelly's son, Macaulay, has an antisocial behaviour order. His mother puts his troubled behaviour down to his drinking. You see him, tell me we're looking for him. Got a lighter on you? OK, Sand, how's he been today? He must be good, mustn't he? I've only got this one. Can't give kids that you see, because I'm doing a film, aren't I? Mm. <laughs> Not allowed to give kids that you see, am I? Yeah, I'll be that's little boy. See Macaulay anywhere, love? What? Macaulay. Have you seen him anywhere? Your Asbo boys. Yeah, it's, it's, that's what they're doing it for, yeah. looking at all Asbos and stuff. Yeah, well, I've got an Asbo and a Cres, and I'm going on there right now. Uh, Have you? Hey, sorry about that camera. <laughs> Older Hay treats children aged up to 16. It's Friday night in the Accident and Emergency Department. An ambulance has just brought in a 13-year-old girl. She's drunk. Her parents wouldn't allow us to film, but we talked to the consultant on duty. So she's quite out of it at the moment. So um, her parents arrived in the last time about you know, past incidents or other, other medications she's taken or anything. And uh, wait until she's a little bit more coherent and she's stopped vomiting. It's a familiar sight on Fridays. We see normally sort of 13, 14, 15 year olds, that kind of age group, and much more girls than guys, um, probably because they just 
physiologically don't handle the alcohol as well and tend to um, feel the, the, the side effects of it a lot more. It also puts additional demands on the medical staff. These are big kids and, and they really can't move or help themselves. They often wet themselves, they're often dirty, they're vomiting. So um, nursing-wise it takes a huge amount of time and a huge amount of involvement to try and, uh, try and look after them for the time they're with us. Um, you can see that we've had a, a few in there. Mm. So One of the A&E nurses took me through the numbers admitted for alcohol misuse over this summer. We started at April, that's mm. when our summer sort of begins, and as we go down the list, mm. basically you can see there's a pattern that over weekends we get like a little clutch on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday. There's four there, isn't there, just one yeah. weekend. Some are very, very drunk and have just come in purely because they've been found collapsed out on the street right. um, due to alcohol, and some of them come in because they've injured themselves when they've been out drinking. And as you can see by our numbers, the majority are young females. We've got 30 young females came in during that period compared to only eight males. In South Liverpool, McCall is now back at home. His bike's got a puncture and he's come back to mend it. We asked him about his drinking. Buy a bottle of vodka every week. It's a £10 a bottle, isn't it? We get people to go in, stand outside the shop, just drink around the streets. It's just boss, it just makes me feel better. But his mother sees things differently. It makes him an angry person, I think. And all his anger comes out when he's drunken and people see a different Macaulay to what we see. And I don't know what it is. When he steps out the house, he completely changes. Do you know where you left it? So is it a fix the puncture? No, we didn't know me pump. Is it in your room? I'm not supposed to know. I'm not going to have a look. Do you want to have to throw the washing everywhere? You know, you're not looking. The washing? I'll go and find it for you. Hold you up, then. Black mask and tea? Yeah. Macaulay says he gets the money from his mother, something she denies. Is that the tape too, yeah? Pass me it? Yeah. Getting excited now, aren't you? Sure. <laughs> Weirdo. Well, don't buy alcohol. Don't give him money for alcohol. No alcohol allowed in this house. No one drinks in this house. When he was much younger, Macaulay was taken to Alder Hay because of drinking at a family party. I drank four bottles of wine. I drank it on the sly. Just had to stay in hospital overnight. Whether four bottles or not, the experience put him off wine. I've never drank wine after it in my life. But it hasn't put him off vodka. What would you say to those people who might be watching this thinking, why can't you control your son? I can control them, but I can't control them 24 hours a day in the community. What we do in our house works brilliantly. What he does when he leaves the house is a different story because I can't follow him around, i.e. 24 hours a day. And when I do find him, he's always behaving himself, so it's behind my back, everything, yeah. To see how kids' drinking affects the hospital, it was time to spend a whole Friday night at Alderhay. It's been a very, very busy last hour here. I can, I can run through the list of the, the children who've been checked in. Four head injuries, seven limb injuries, uh, three fevers and vomiting. There's an infected finger and a suspected swine flu. But so far, nobody who's been drinking. Then suddenly, the atmosphere changes. Just before 10, a drunken 13-year-old arrives. What's she been drinking? Vodka, apparently. How much? Uh, we don't know at the moment, but it sounds like she's been drinking the vodka straight. Thank you. We saw her being wheeled in. She clearly wasn't sure where she was. She was pu pulled into a booth just around the corner there. And, uh, and makeup was, was all over the place, and you could hear her throwing up. We know a bit more about what had happened to her. She'd been drinking in a park, very near here, actually. Her friends had become concerned about her, concerned about the state she was in, and, and they brought her here. And since she's been here, really, she hasn't stopped being sick. And her mum's on her way down at the moment. Her mother asked us not to show her identity. But we watch nurses attend to the drunken teenager as other families with sick children looked on. 
<laughs> Our A&E department is there for a reason. It is to deal with conditions of children that may be very serious indeed and they're very busy and we have to get our patients seen quickly. We want them sorted and either back home or into the hospital if they, if they need to be. So if we're dealing with drunk children we don't need to be, that's again wasting our time. So how are some of our children getting on? Lawrence, the boy who is battling his weight, is doing well. He's learning the violin and taking part in a school's concert. The post-concert buffet allows him to put his resistance to the test with only one minor blip. Could that be chocolate cake? I refuse to answer that question. <laughs> Five-year-old Leon is still waiting for the results of blood tests. It'll be six months before his mother will know for sure why he's so big. And a month after we filmed him, Macaulay says he's given up drinking vodka. How long do you think you'll last not drinking? I haven't drunk for ages now. But if you, for whatever reason, got hold of 50 quid today, how quickly would you be using that on alcohol? I wouldn't. So that's good. It's a start, isn't it? It's changed. Wouldn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't buy alcohol with it. Why? If you like it so much. Because I wouldn't. Because you're realising that's bad for you, isn't it? Because I don't drink no more, that's why. Why don't you drink anymore? Because my mum, my mum told me if I drink anymore, she's not going to give me all no money, so I'm not. The fact is, some get the message and some don't. But things are going in the wrong direction. More and more children who require hospital treatment for conditions that are preventable. Do you think people get the scale of what's going on? I don't think everybody does. Um, I think that we've never been here before. We've never faced this epidemic. It didn't happen in history. That was cholera epidemics, that was measles epidemics, that was whooping cough epidemics. It was never as in your face as that. It's subtle, it's in the background, but it's, it's massive. <laughs> Another morning at Alderhay, Tasha has arrived to have baby teeth taken out. She's only two. Just another day in the life of a hospital whose patients are telling us something worrying about the way we live. <laughs> 